Hey everybody, meteorologist Brady Taylor here with this week's Degrees of Science. This week, we're talking with former NASA astronaut Dr. Bernard Harris, who was born in Central Texas. Dr. Harris served on two shuttle missions and spent 18 total days in space. During his second mission, he became the first African-American astronaut to perform a spacewalk. Now, beyond just being an astronaut, Dr. Harris is also an advocate for the growth of, growth of STEM education for kids. Here's a look at the interview. Well, we're joined with Dr. Bernard Harris. Dr. Harris, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's an honor to get to talk to a, an astronaut, a, uh, I guess your official title, former NASA astronaut. Tell folks, how exactly did you get into becoming an astronaut? I know that's a very specialized opportunity. Kind of what did your career path take you into that uh, chance to become an astronaut? Well, I was like every other kid in the 1960s and 1969 in particular that watched Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin land on the moon and wanted to follow in their footsteps. That's how it began. So I remember distinctly looking at the little black and white television and, and telling my mom, who was an educator, that I wanted to be an astronaut. That's awesome. So. I looked and my numbers may be a little off. There's only been 23 astronauts born in the state of Texas and you're one of those and you're a Texan, but you're also a central Texan. I can only find two that were born in central Texas. You were born in Temple, right? That's correct. Born in Temple, 1956. That was quite a while ago, <laughs> uh, but uh, proud to, to be from central Texas and proud to be a Texan because I've spent most of my life in Texas and now live in Houston. Awesome. So you have done two space missions, both STS-55 on Columbia and STS-63 on Discovery. So for folks that like me that would dream to do something like that, how amazing is just one getting the chance to be an astronaut? I, you know, being from the South, I always put things in perspective as uh, being a blessing. So I've been blessed to not only be an astronaut, not only go to medical school, but to combine all of those talents into what I do as an astronaut. So I'm the crew medical officer on missions, uh, mission specialist, and I get a chance to take care of the crew and get a chance to do a, a lot of the research that we're doing in low, low Earth orbit. But it's just, um, you know, it's just a fascinating uh, career. Uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, knowing what an astronaut does, what are the things that's the, the most scariest thing? And I have to say the liftoff definitely yes. is the most scariest thing. In, and uh, so blasting off in the space, only taking eight and a half minutes to get to orbit, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, gets your attention. Well, what Now I wanna go, I'm gonna ask you several just kind of firsthand perspective deals. You're sitting in the shuttle, strapped to a pretty much a bomb ready to blow up. What's going through your head as, you know, once the countdown gets going, there's nothing really for you to do there. What's going through your head as you're getting ready to lift off and go into space? There is a lot of preparation that uh, goes around uh, every liftoff. You know, we get up pretty early in the morning, depending on the, the mission uh, launch time. And it takes three hours for us to get suited up and then to go out to the launch tower and go in one by one into the space, uh, in my case, the space shuttle, where we have suit technicians that help us get into our seat and, and uh, hook us up. And then when they close that door, that's when you know that you're about to do something that very few people have got a chance to do before. And yeah, there was that, that moment where I said to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> and realized huh? they had locked the door and I couldn't get out anyway. So I was all, I was gonna uh, be going along for the ride, whatever ride I got. So I know y'all do some underwater testing to get used to the lack of gravity, but that first time when you were on Space Shuttle Columbia, y'all launch up, what was that feeling like the first time that you didn't have gravity? That what, just that being in space, what, what was that feeling like? Well, first of all, you get into this situation of hypergravity, meaning when the main engine's light, you get catapulted into the air, air. And what that does is push you back in your seat to three to three and a half times your weight. So you feel really heavy and can't barely move. And it's extremely noisy as you're going off into space. But as soon as we get to around 200 nautical miles above the earth and the engine's cut off, 
you go from all this noise and chaos to just smooth as glass. And then you begin to see things kind of rise up before you. And that's your checklist or your gloves that you're taking off or your helmet that you're taking off. And you know that I am in space. Now that, that, that is amazing. So uh, you have a distinction of not only being an astronaut, but the first African-American astronaut to do a spacewalk. How big of a badge of honor is that for you to have that title? Well, I, you know, I, I don't um, carry that title uh, lightly because uh, until the moment in which I had uh, done my spacewalk, it had been 30 years since the first uh, American walk in space. And so it took that long, of course, to uh, for a person of color uh, to actually go out and, and uh, do that space walk. So I remember getting a call from then President Clinton uh, congratulating me along with others of some of the accomplishments of, of the mission. And I told him that, uh, Mr. President, I may be the first, but would not be the last. And and that it was prophetic, of course, because we had multiple uh, people of color who have now uh, been involved in building the International Space Station and being involved in the, in the uh, space program. And really have the, the space program has turned into what I think has been a great melting pot of humanity, not only of, of, of different ethnicities uh, within our nation, but around the world. And I think that bodes well to where we're going as human beings. All right, so you talked about what it felt like in space, but very, very few people have ever done an actual space walk. What was the feeling like to be floating in space, just tethered to something, streaming around the Earth as fast as you were? I know you didn't feel the speed, but what was that feeling, just floating out in space like that? Well, the fact uh, uh, the matter is that you do feel the speed. Mm. It's not like being in a car, you know, where you roll the windows down and you feel the wind uh, passing you by because there's no atmosphere. But you are moving across the surface of the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. So if you look down at the Earth, you can actually feel that sensation of movement. So most of the time we don't do that because that can make you look, feel a little dizzy and we focus on the uh, payload bay of the car, you know, uh, cargo payload bay, or whatever we're doing, because it's all moving at the same speed. So relative to the Earth, uh, things in proximity of the spaceship uh, move at the same speed. And so uh, you do have to pay attention, because if you look down as the sun is rising, say you go from nighttime to daytime, it can be a little startling when you look down and see how fast you're moving. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you had an issue with your glove while you were out on your spacewalk, isn't that correct? So we had an issue with the space suits when we were out. And that was, uh, our mission was one of the few missions that was in a high inclination orbit, which means around 52 degrees latitude. If you remember, you know, in elementary school, like you know, the globe, you had lines of longitude and lines of latitude. So that means that we were further north which means even in space, it's colder. And our suits were used to being around 20 degrees around the equator um, area, you know, just above the equator. And so our suits got extremely cold as we um, did a night pass, went into a night pass where the temperature around us dropped to minus 165. And the temperatures in the suit were around 20 degrees. Uh, the suit was not able to, to um, take care of that that um, that extreme temperatures until we came back and they did the modifications of the suit so now the suits are able to have additional warmers and way in which to keep the crew yeah not easy uh, to do a lot of work when it's 20 degrees feeling i'm sure you can't you can't move at all oh that, that is amazing so uh now on your shuttle missions you were there to to do work what all kind of uh, research projects were you doing on your two missions that you went to space so my first mission was STS-55, which was a joint uh, mission with the European Space Agency. Their training facility, by the way, is in Europe and uh, in um, Germany. And so we trained at a place called DLR. And there we had a cargo bay um, laboratory uh, that, that fit in the cargo bay where we had about 91 different experiments ranging from furnaces for creating new materials to 
taking uh, animals uh, up in space, including uh, tadpoles and, and fish. Uh, we had a telescope to look further into the Milky Way. And, and then we did a lot of experiments on us as human beings because there are a lot of changes that, that we suffer through. My second mission was SES-63, and this is where we did this joint mission with the Russian government. So I trained over in Russia uh, for a couple of years prior to going into the space. We went to the uh, main objective was to go to the Mir space station. And then in that, we still, still had additional experiments of around 40 or 50 additional experience, ex experiments in orbit. On your second mission, I, I saw y'all actually took a Coca-Cola machine with you up to space? <laughs> we did. Okay. And uh, actually, um, we we did the, the first uh, taste test from space. I was sharing this with a friend of mine just recently, uh, where we took up uh, Coca-Cola. And what they were working on was a uh, dispenser, a way in which to dispense Coke, because we can't take carbonated beverages up in space. And the reason is that it causes um, the microgravity causes the carbonation to come out of fluid. So what we ended up with, even though we tried our best, we would have this, these special cans that we put the mix to serve and the carbonation in. And no matter how we did it, it would always end up with foam, almost like an icy, except for it was hot. <laughs> it was not cold. Um, so kind of go back to some of your day-to-day -day activities up there. Um, you know, I, all of us have seen the video of, you know, like the liquid becomes the little balls and eating and all that is different. The one thing that I'm intrigued with is the sleeping arrangement, because I'm one of those that really got to have the blanket on me and you're pretty much floating, kind of strapped into a sleeping bag, right? How, how hard was it for you to get comfortable and fall asleep when you have no gravity to help with that prospect? Yeah, you, you've already sort of uh, alluded to that we have a sleeping bag that has hooks on them so we can hook them to the wall, the ceiling, the floor, wherever, or float in the middle. And we basically float inside, zip ourselves up in the sleeping bag. And the sleeping bag has a way in which you can bring your arms out of the sleeping bag so you can actually put your arms and, you know, outside, you know, scratch your nose and do whatever you need to, need to do. And you just float inside, if you imagine, just floating inside the sleeping bag. Now, unlike you, Brady, I, I, I have to have a pillow and have to have cover. And so um, NASA came up with a, a way in which we can take a pillow with a big, big large Velcro strap, and you strap the pillow to your head, and it makes it feel like you're lying in bed on your, you know, depending on side is on your right side. If you want to flip over, you just flip the pillow over, and you lay on the right side. It's just kind of funny on the other it's side. Be a little, little um, adjustment time. Those, those little adjustments kind of make a difference because it does take time to, to actually learn how to sleep in microgravity. And you spent a total of 18 days in space, right? Yes. Yeah, that, that's awesome. So you're, you've got a medical background, and I saw that a lot of your research that you did with NASA was for some of the how the human body deals with being in space. Um, and now that we're leaning more to people being in the International Space Station for extended periods and then missions to Mars, what kind of work have you done to help you know, the, the human body deal with the, the lack of gravity and the effects of being in space? So my first job at NASA was as a clinical scientist, as a researcher, and my job was to work part of what we call the crude healthcare system, check system. And my part of that system was to develop uh, ways in which to obviate the changes that occur in the human body. I kind of alluded to that earlier. We lose 1% of bone per month, we lose about 15% of muscle mass. Our heart gets smaller. We're not able to fight off illnesses. And the best countermeasure for that, those things is exercise. So my team helped to develop the exercise equipment that uh, flew on the shuttle and then basically the foundation for the exercise equipment that we have on the International Space Station, where the crew, um, by mandate, had to exercise one to two hours a day so that they can stay in shape. Because think about this, the reason why all those things occur is that we have grown up in a one gravity environment and now we're in a microgravity environment and the body's adapting to that environment. And because it's adapting to that environment, it, it just wreaks havoc with the, with our uh, physiological systems. And so we have to come up with ways in which to prevent that from occurring. 
Now, as for an astronaut, everything going on right now has got to be really exciting for you. How excited are you about the new Artemis program and the possibility of uh, having astronauts on the moon uh, within a few years, possibly? You know, as I told you at the beginning of our conversation, my inspiration was going to the moon, was following the footsteps of those, those guys. And uh, to see now us going back this time, not just to put, you know, leave our fingerprints and, and plant a flag, but actually to, uh, to prepare to stay for long durations. And um, I always joke, uh, sometimes I tell people I, I wanted to go to the moon, be part of the habitat, then on the back, of, on the outside of the habitat would be a sign that says Bernard Harris, MD, open for business. <laughs> but I'm excited about what, what we're doing and where that's taking us as, as a, as a uh, human population. Now, you, you've got a, a extreme passion for what you do. And uh, one of the great things we like to do with these conversations is not only talk about the career you have, but the work you're doing to promote education when it comes to STEM style education. And uh, I know you've done a lot of work to help promote STEM in uh, that education field when it comes to kids. Uh, tell our viewers what, what your foundation and what all you've been working on. So one of the, the important aspects of my life in which I call my terrestrial mission, if you consider what I did before the extraterrestrial mission being out in space, my new mission now, my new ministry, as I like to put it, is to ensure that all of our students and the communities in which they come from have the opportunity to, to get good paying jobs and to participate in what I think is the next industrial revolution, which is a, a uh, revolution that's going to involve STEM at its heart, at its core. Uh, nine out of the 10 jobs in the future haven't been invented yet. Nine out of 10 jobs now and certainly in the future are gonna require expertise in math and science. But yet, if you look at certain populations within our country, these, these um, uh, communities are not prepared for that future where technology, whether you are white, black, brown, or indifferent, just not prepared if you think about it. And so we're gonna be moving from, moving into this new industrial revolution that's gonna be driven by technology so how do we stay leaders in the world? And that is to invest in our youth. And that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years with my foundation and now through the National Math and Science Initiative. Well, that, that, that is amazing for sure. So uh, again, for folks that didn't see at the beginning, you're one of two astronauts that have ever been born in Central Texas. If we had a kid sitting here in Central Texas watching this right now, that had a dream of pursuing a science career or an ultimate dream like I had when I was a kid of being an astronaut, what would you say to those kids right now? I would tell them these words, that they are infinite beings with infinite possibilities. And uh, every time I have a chance to get up in front of an audience of young people, I like to remind them of who they are, who they really are that they have this unlimited capability to do anything they want to do. It's up to them that they're born with talents, that they are born multipotential and that they're born with a purpose or purposes that they are supposed to do while they're here on earth. And it doesn't matter whether you're in central Texas or in inner city Houston, what matters is what you, what's up here and what your mindset is. And so we have that growth mindset and that ability to learn, to be this perpetual learning learner, which I call, we call lifelong learners, then there is nothing that you can't do. Oh, that, that is amazing. And I always tell kids, you know, like I said, I wanted to be an astronaut, I had my head in the clouds. I just never came down from the clouds. I just stayed there. And like I said, always wanting to learn. Well, Dr. Harris, this has been an amazing conversation. I, I love to hear about your career and again, your kind of your terrestrial uh, career now that you're into. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been my pleasure.